Join Wondery Plus to listen to Business Wars one week early and ad-free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. It's early evening, summer 2017. Production manager Jamie Lake slugs back lukewarm coffee as he pulls on to exit 216 of the Trans-Canada Highway. His assistant dozes in the passenger seat. Lake nudges his assistant's shoulder. Wake up. We're almost there. His assistant stretches and takes in the surroundings. What do you think? Eighth time's the charm? Lake gives a non-committal grunt. They've spent the last 12 hours crisscrossing the greater Vancouver area, scouting locations for the upcoming movie A Rocky Mountain Christmas for the Hallmark Channel. It's about a woman who escapes to her uncle's ranch after a breakup and meets a Hollywood actor preparing for a role. The town has to be perfect, quaint and welcoming, like the audience is stepping into a snow globe. But so far, nothing's been quite right. Lake turns right, then right again, and suddenly they're driving down the picturesque main street of Fort Langley, British Columbia. Clabbered storefronts painted bright red, yellow, and green line the streets. Lush, leafy trees dot the sidewalks. Signs advertise bookstores, clothing boutiques, and cozy coffee shops. Lake's assistant grabs his camera and bounds out of the car. Lake adjusts his baseball cap low on his head and ambles after him. His assistant grins as he takes a photo of an ice cream parlor. This is what I'm talking about. This is a Hallmark card come to life. Lake strokes his salt and pepper goatee and narrows his eyes. Ugh, it's perfect. Just like it was perfect in the six other Hallmark movies I can think of just off the top of my head we shot here in the past five years. We can't keep going back to the same old places. They'll lose that magical feeling. Lake's voice trails off as he spots a man across the street snapping photos. His assistant follows his gaze. Is that John again? That's the third time we've seen him today. Yeah, he must be scouting for lifetime. They keep nosing in on our locations. Come on, let's see the next town. There's only one left, and it's pretty far from Vancouver. Lake shrugs. We don't have a choice. The assistant nods, and the two haul themselves back into the car. They head out to the next town in search of the perfect street to create Christmas movie magic. The Lifetime Scouts right behind them. From Wondery, I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. Christmas. Tis the season to deck the halls, build snowmen, sip hot chocolate, and exchange presents with loved ones. But over the past 10 years, a new tradition has emerged. Watching low-budget holiday movies made for television. The plots follow familiar lines. There's secret royalty, Christmas festivals that save the town, baking contests that advance the protagonist's career, big city women falling in love with small-town men, precocious children setting up their single parents, and so forth. Whatever shape the plot takes, the hero or heroine finds love and rekindles their Christmas spirit, and it always, always snows on Christmas. Although these movies are derided as cheesy and silly, they are big business, bringing in millions in advertising revenue and keeping their channels afloat. In 2009, the Hallmark Channel launches Countdown to Christmas. Starting the day after Thanksgiving, they air 450 hours of holiday programming and premiere four original movies by Christmas. It's a ratings hit. 
usually ranked somewhere between 10th and 20th most watched cable channels, in December they become the number one cable channel in the country. Competing channel Lifetime takes note. And in 2012, they launched their own block of Christmas programming with original movies at the center. It sparks a rivalry that has lasted almost a decade and shows no signs of abating. The two companies are locked into an arms race, producing more and more Christmas movies each year. They vie with each other for locations, actors, crew, and of course, viewers. And when streaming behemoth Netflix moves in by producing its own Christmas movies, well, the competition only becomes more intense. In our new five-part series, we dive into the competition between Hallmark, Lifetime, and Netflix as they battle it out to be America's primary destination for Christmas movies. While the films may be full of goodwill and cheer, the rivalry is as cold and dark as a lump of coal. This is Episode 1, A Very Merry Rivalry. It's September 2010 in Los Angeles. Bill Abbott, the CEO of Crown Media, which owns the Hallmark Channel, and Michelle Vickery, the head of Hallmark Programming, sit in a screening room at the company's headquarters. Outside, it's a record-breaking 113 degrees. But on the screen, the actors don parkas and drink hot chocolate at a Christmas parade. You really want me to blog about a crazy old man who thinks he's Abbott Santa and Vickery Paul? are watching footage from a movie currently shooting in Canada. And they are not happy. It's scheduled to premiere in just a few months as part of their second-ever Countdown to Christmas block of programming. And it's not what they envisioned. Vickery shakes her head in frustration, her long, white, blonde hair sashaying across her back. Vickery is in her late 40s. She got her start in music, working with bands like Nirvana and Hole. But television was always her passion. What is this? I see, like, two Christmas lights behind them. It should be Times Square back there. Christmas lights everywhere. Abbott rubs his hand over his balding head, sharing Vickery's frustration. 48 years old, Abbott's been with Crown Media since before the Hallmark Channel even existed. He started in advertising sales and only became CEO last year. One of his first major decisions was to bet big on Christmas movies. But now, he's having his doubts. I thought we were clear in our pre-production meetings. Every shot needs to explode with Christmas. This is hinting at Christmas. Our audience sees a Hallmark movie as a magical world, that sense of wonder. That's how we compete against the classics. Abbott slumps in his seat. Other channels, notably ABC Family, which is owned by Disney, and the broadcast networks have the resources to air classic Christmas films. They show movies like It's a Wonderful Life, A Christmas Story, and Polar Express during December. In contrast, Crown Media is independently owned, and they have to make their own films on small budgets. We made one-third of our total ad revenue last year in November and December. We can't afford to get this wrong. Do you think we expanded production too much? Last year, the Hallmark Channel premiered four original Christmas movies. This year, they're slated to premiere ten. Vickery shakes her head adamantly. We crunched the numbers. We saw how much our ratings increased last year. Viewers are hungry for Christmas programming. We just have to get our filmmakers on board. They're not just making films. They're brand ambassadors. And our brand is Christmas magic. Once we get them to understand that, we'll be golden. Abbott sits up straighter and reaches for his cell phone. You're right. It's not too late to correct this. They're only on day three of filming. We can impress on them the importance of having Christmas in every inch of the frame. Vickery nods. Don't worry, we'll dominate Christmas. We're the only people doing what we do at the scale we do it. That's a real itch. Hi, Jason. It's Bill. Listen, I need to talk to production as soon as possible. But across the country, another channel has taken notice of Hallmark's success. And they want in on the Christmas cheer. It's 2011. 
Ansi Dubuque paces in front of a conference room at Lifetime Entertainment's headquarters in New York City. Dubuque adjusts her glasses. In her early 40s, Dubuque took over as head of Lifetime last year after running the History Channel. She turned that network's rating woes around by cutting back on some of the serious documentaries the channel was famous for and introducing a slate of reality shows, including Pawn Stars and Ice Road Truckers. The shows were cheap to produce and proved popular, a winning combination. Now, she's tasked with reviving the Lifetime channel. In just a few minutes, a stream of executives will enter the conference room, and she's going to tell them about her new vision. That includes telling her team everything they're doing that's not working. She knows this won't be a fun conversation, but it has to be done. The door opens, and over 20 executives file in, taking seats around the table. Dubuque smiles. As soon as everyone's seated, Dubuque closes the door. She looks at the grim faces of the executives staring at her. Okay, we might as well dive in. It's no secret I was brought in to give this channel a makeover. My predecessor took some gambles that didn't always pay off. Obviously, the biggest was securing the rights to Project Runway from Bravo. The ratings, unfortunately, didn't follow. Hey, we have some incredible scripted series. I love Army Wives and Drop Dead Diva, but we have to face the fact that their audiences are shrinking. An older executive holds a legal pad in front of his mouth and grouses to his seat neighbor. How much you want to bet she's going to suggest we need to expand our reality slate? So much cheaper to produce, you know. (laughs) His seat neighbor chuckles quietly. No way, I'm not taking that bet. That's what every higher-up says these days. Dubuque takes a sip of water, then launches into the next part of her presentation. Now, I know a lot of you are worried that I'm going to turn Lifetime into a reality television factory. And... That's a valid concern given my track record at the History Channel. And it's true. There's room to expand our reality offerings. But I also want to lean into what we're doing well. Right now, we are killing it in the original movie game. There's a big area where we could expand our offerings. Christmas. We should be doing our own block of Christmas programming the way Hallmark is. The older executive and his neighbor exchange a confused look. The older executive leans forward. This is asinine. I have to say something. The older executive raises his hand. (laughs) Look, I don't mean any disrespect here, but our original movies tend to have a salacious spin. I mean, some of the titles we've produced since I've been here include My Stepson, My Lover, and uh, Secret Sins of the Father, uh, Co-Ed Call Girl, you know? I, I... I know we've done Christmas movies here and there, but does it make sense to make them a big part of our brand? Dubuque shakes her head. She anticipated this response. Lifetime made its first Christmas movie in 1999. That's before the Hallmark Channel even existed, but we've seeded the market. Here's the reality. We average higher ratings than Hallmark all year long. Then the holiday season comes along and they completely outperform us. They go after the same demographic we do, women 25 to 54. According to the numbers, they want Christmas movies. I want our version of Countdown to Christmas. Let's get cracking on it. She raises her eyebrow at the older executive as if asking him, got it? The executive grudgingly nods. As the executives stream out, Dubuque hopes her confidence in this strategy pays off. This holiday season, it's a wonderful lifetime. It's October 11th, 2012, Los Angeles. Hallmark executives Bill Abbott and Michelle Vickery are watching a preview for Lifetime's newly announced block of Christmas programming. Vickery shakes her head. Well, they do say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. At least we're premiering 14 new movies. They've only got 10. Vickery winks. Amateurs. (laughs) (laughs) They both chuckle. Then Vickery drops her smile. But seriously, I'm not worried. 
Sure, Lifetime as a cable channel is older than the Hallmark Channel, but Hallmark itself is a 110-year-old company and one of the most well-defined brands in the world. Our movies are a perfect representation of that brand. Do they really think people are going to tune into the same channel that airs things called My Boyfriend the Serial Killer for the holidays? Abbott tugs at his tie. Raised on Long Island, he still isn't used to how hot the fall is in Los Angeles. Still, it wouldn't hurt to up our game a little bit. I mean, as we're thinking about next year, let's just make sure we're not getting complacent. We don't want to take anything for granted. Vickery nods in agreement. It might make sense to increase our star power. Find an actress who can really serve as the face of the company. That can set us apart from Lifetime. Definitely. Plus, of course, more movies. If Lifetime's jumping in with ten, who knows how many they'll add next year. Agreed. We have some work to do. But finding a star for their movies won't be as easy as they think. And soon, another bigger company will be unwrapping their own Christmas movie treats. There are a lot of things about getting some years under your belt that are pretty cool. For one thing, you have more experience and therefore a little more confidence. But for a lot of guys, there's something else that happens as you age. Two out of three of men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35. I know that's been true for a lot of my friends, and it can be pretty tough to deal with. But here's the thing. Prevention is key. And there are two FDA-approved medications that can prevent hair loss. And our sponsor, Keeps, offers both. Keeps is a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair. When you use Keeps, you'll get convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door in discreet packaging every three months. It's low cost. Treatments start at just $10 a month, and they offer generic versions of their medications, too. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors because they deliver proven results. So try them out today. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so the earlier you get started, the better. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to K-E-E-P-S dot com slash B-W to get your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash B-W to get your first month free. One more time, that's Keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash B-W. It's spring 2013 in Los Angeles. Hallmark executives Bill Abbott and Michelle Vickery are meeting with a casting director. Hallmark has stayed ahead of Lifetime in the ratings, but last year Lifetime had its best year yet, and Hallmark has hit a snag with its quest to find a channel-defining star. The casting director takes a deep breath. It's time to deliver the bad news. Unfortunately... Everyone on our initial list has turned us down. Most agents are saying the pay is just too low. Abbott shifts in his chair, annoyed. Did you explain that every year we have over a thousand hours of holiday programming to fill? We re-air movies all the time. They'll make up the difference in residuals. The casting director nods. I did, but I think there's a bigger problem. Uh Uh-huh. They look down on us. It's still seen as a blemish on people's resumes to be in a Hallmark movie. You know, this is coastal elitism. Our holiday programming brought in over 56 million viewers last year. But the industry thinks we're a joke, huh? Vickery, who's been staring out the window, turns. I think we just need to embrace who we are. So many channels are going dark and edgy. They want shows about science teachers turned meth dealers and murderous congressmen. That's never going to be us. We're never going to be hip. We're the channel for people who want to remember simpler times, who want to get away from politics and darkness. The casting director nods, understanding what Vickery is getting at. Our casting should tap into those feelings. Actors who bring up nostalgia. In a way, it helps if they haven't worked much recently. People will just remember them from their early roles. She crosses to a whiteboard, 
and begins writing. If our core demographic is women ages 25 to 54... Abbott crosses next to her. And we skew to the older side of that. The casting director nods. Then we want to target actors who were on hit shows in the 80s and 90s. I specifically say shows, because those are the actors who came into living rooms week after week. They were their friends, neighbors, crushes. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking The Wonder Years, Full House, Saved by the Bell, Boy Meets World. The casting director nods and writes them down. I definitely think there are stars on these shows that will be thrilled to appear in Hallmark movies, even more than one a year. We need actors who embody our wholesome, tradition-minded brand. No one edgy or arty. Oh, and definitely no one with a criminal record. Hallmark casts Lori Laughlin, who starred as Aunt Becky on Full House in two of its series. She also agrees to be in a Christmas movie, making her the face of Hallmark. Going into the 2013 holiday season, Hallmark feels good about their prospects against Lifetime. But a deep-pocketed rival is about to spike the eggnog. It's December 20th, 2014. Karen Shaler sits in a small New York City apartment, furiously typing at her beat-up laptop. Seven years ago, at age 40, Shaler gave up a successful broadcast journalism career and moved to New York to become a screenwriter. It hasn't been the fairy tale journey she imagined. The economy crashed less than a year after her move, and she's had to cash out her 401k to support herself. But she hasn't given up her dreams. And over the holidays, she's determined to write this next script. She really believes it could sell. A producer she recently met thinks so, too. She reaches the end of the page and reads back what she wrote. Prince Richard, Amber, and Princess Emily throw snowballs at each other. They laugh as each snowball hits its mark. Amber slips. Prince Richard falls too, landing on top of her. They look into each other's eyes. Time stops. Their heads draw nearer to each other. Then suddenly a snowball pelts Prince Richard in the shoulder. Princess Emily. Hey, no socializing with the enemy! Shaler smiles to herself. Almost kiss. Check. Shaler loves Hallmark movies, and she has studied their formula extensively. She knows they have nine acts, and an almost kiss always occurs in Act 7. Shaler's phone rings. It's one of her friends from back home in Seattle. Hey! Hey, I realized I forgot to call you yesterday for your birthday. I'm the worst. But actually, you're the worst for not coming home for Christmas. You're Christmas Karen. No one loves Christmas more than you do. I can't believe you're going to be all by yourself. I know, but I really want to finish this script. I'm really excited about it. It's about a journalist who travels to Europe to look into rumors that a prince is going to abdicate the throne. She goes undercover as a tutor for his younger sister and finds out there's more to the prince than meets the eye. And they fall in love? Of course. I love it. Good luck. I don't want to stop the creative flow. Shaler gets back to work, turning up the Hallmark movie she's been playing in the background. She wants to capture the tone perfectly. The downside of writing this type of movie is that there aren't a lot of places she can sell it. If she can't secure a green light from Hallmark or Lifetime, she might not get another chance. It's 2016, two years later. Shaler is sitting in the basement of Fox News, where she works as a correspondent. She doesn't like it, but she needs the paycheck. She checks the caller ID. It's the producer she's been working with on her Christmas script. Hello? I got good news. Your script's sold. Shaler lets out a silent scream and pumps her fists in excitement. I can't believe my movie's going to be on Hallmark. Oh, uh, Hallmark didn't buy it. Lifetime? No, uh, uh, it's Netflix. Shaler's surprised, but not disappointed. Her movie's getting made. 
The more people making these movies, the better for her career. She continues to dance in her cubicle. The executives at Hallmark and Lifetime aren't quite as pleased. They've carved out niches in the industry by making cheap content in bulk. But Netflix is the Death Star, a tech company with a seemingly unlimited budget. Both companies will have to up their games to compete with each other and Netflix. But will their attempts to outdo each other saturate the market? On our next episode, we go back in time to the origins of Hallmark's foray into television and see how a young, flailing cable channel saved itself by embracing the Christmas spirit. From Wondery, this is episode one of Christmas Movie Wars for Business Wars. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review and be sure to tell your friends. Follow Business Wars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. You can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey and tell us which business stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on historical research. I'm your host, David Brown. Austin Rackless wrote this story. Voice acting by Michelle Philippi. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Sound designed by Kyle Randall. Our producer is Dave Schilling. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Hernan Lopez for Wondering.